welcome everybody. I want to welcome everybody to our evening panel. Uh, my name is David Herman. I'm from the University of Virginia, Slavic department. Um, while I'm here, let me introduce the second speaker as well. Um, second speaker is Austin Sharon from, did I say that right? Great. Um, Austin's a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at the University of Kansas. His research interests center around socio-spatial identities in the former Soviet Union and how they're shaped by ethnicity, borders, territory, and popular discourses thereof. His work uh, has focused primarily on Crimea and Siberia. So. All right, well, thank you all for, for still being here, for sticking it out and being here so late. Um, I want to uh, begin just by noting a bit of irony here in the fact that um, if this had been a year or a little bit more ago that uh, the work I've done uh, looking at Crimea may not have actually qualified for, for inclusion in, in this conference as it was still universally recognized as a Ukrainian region and not a Russian region, at least in the Rasiski sense, right? So uh, if I can say any, anything truly positive about the, the developments of the past year, it's that it's afforded me the opportunity to speak here at this conference uh, on this topic. Um, so uh, I want to uh, I want to just, uh, before I move forward, highlight a couple of the pictures I have here on my introductory slide. Uh, on the left, I have a, a picture of a billboard I took, uh, a photo I took in Crimea in 2009, um, put up by the uh, Ukrainian political party, the party of the regions, uh, that emphatically states, we are Crimean, right? We Krimchanya, right? This sort of statement of a, of a strong regional identity, of a celebration of being from Crimea, right? Well, on the right, I juxtapose that with an image from the past year, from a march down the center of, of Simferopol celebrating the reunification of Russia uh, with Crimea, right? This sort of very, very different view about who, who Crimeans are and where they belong and how they tend to identify. And this will, will sort of undergird some of my, um, my discussion here. So oh, let's pick up a little bit. But um, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us here are, are somewhat familiar with the events of the past year. If you're like me, you've been glued to the news cycles um, about all the news that's come out of Ukraine. But I want to. Uh, highlight a few key dates that relate to Crimea and to the, to the um, annexation of it there. Um, it really begins for Crimea on February 23rd of last year, just over a year ago, uh, with the violent climax and conclusion of the Euromaidan and the ousting of President Yanukovych there. And we now know by uh, President Putin's own admission that a plan was quickly put in place to seize and to ultimately annex Crimea directly in response to these events. Right? He, he, he had denied it. They had, there had been some, some ambiguity about it until just recently. In the past couple of weeks, a new documentary has come out, has aired, in which he, he makes this very explicit that the plan was put in place in, in response to the violence um, they experienced in the Euromaidan and to the, the overthrow of President Yanukovych there. So only four days later, we see these quote unquote little green men uh, appearing in the streets of Crimea, right, with bearing these, these military. Um, figures bearing no insignia, right, giving no hint to where they're, they're coming from. It was pretty clear to most people at the time where they, who they were and where they had come from, that these were Russian um, uh, military types, right? And again, it was later by Putin's own admission that we learned that this was in fact the case, right? So these, these uh, uh, little green men appear. They seize control of the airport in Simferopol. They seize control of uh, various military facilities in the peninsula, and they also seize control of the Supreme uh, Council building, the, the capital uh, of Simferopol, right, where they forcefully install a new government loyal to Russia. They install uh, former Deputy, Deputy Sergei Aksionov as the new Prime Minister of Crimea, and this new government uh, immediately declares that they're going to hold a referendum on the status of Crimea and on the question of it leaving Ukraine and joining Russia, right? This referendum is held only a few weeks later on March 16th, right? Should note that this is a referendum that was held against the Ukrainian constitution under Russian military occupation, right? With only observers from sort of a motley crew of European right-wing politicians, very favorable and sympathetic to, to the Russians' views uh, on Crimea and of their, their ambitions there, right? So there are many reasons to be, to be highly skeptical of, of the, the, the veracity and the uh, um, le legitimacy of this referendum. Um, but despite outcries from the West, this, this, uh, this referendum moves forward, and surprise, surprise, there's an overwhelming vote uh, in, order, uh, in favor of joining Russia, right? 
Uh, and it's only two days after that, on March 18th, that President Putin signs the Treaty of Ascension of the Republic of Crimea to the Russian Federation, officially marking uh, the annexation of Crimea and its absorption into uh, the Russian Federation. All right, so I have some images here from, from the day of the referendum. Right, we see people voting, holding their Russian flags. There's, there's voting happens with great fanfare. Right, they come out in droves, as we're, we've seen in the media. Right, it's met with great celebration both in Crimea here and in, and in Russia. Right, and uh, I'm sure we've all seen the, the uh, numbers too, the figures from the official results from the referendum, but I highlight them here. Keep in mind that uh, voting happened in two separate administrative uh, territories. Right, there's the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, separately administered, and so we have separate numbers from each of these. But uh, for the option on the referendum, there are two options. Right, we have here uh, for to vote for Crimea becoming a subject of the Russian Federation and for a, reinst a reinstating of the 1992 Crimean Constitution within. Uh, remaining within Ukraine in that case. A brief note about that constitution, uh, it was one that existed for a brief period that gave uh, Crimea a wide degree of autonomy, essentially giving it the right to declare its independence and to secede from Ukraine if it, if it saw necessary. So this is why many in the West have sort of labeled this referendum as a choice between uh, joining Russia now or joining Russia later. In, a sense, in essence, there really was no, no way to voice uh, your opinion for the status quo or for any, any uh, opinion besides ultimately joining Russia. Uh, but despite this, the subtle difference between the answers, we see overwhelmingly, almost unanimously, the, uh, the referendum results showed that people wanted to join Russia, right? Over 95% in both territories, right? With overwhelming voter turnout, over 80%, all close to 90% in Sevastopol, right? So as Russians celebrated, many of us in the West here uh, looked with skepticism towards this, right? Me in particular, I, uh, having done research in Crimea, having spent a lot of time there, I had great reason to be skeptical of these results, right? For one, from the work that I've, I've done there that I'll, I'll be getting to in just a moment, uh, but also looking at uh, polls, data that have come out of Crimea in the years leading up to the annexation, right? For example, we have a uh, poll from the uh, Razumkov Center, the Ukrainian um, institution here in 2008, which found that 63.8% of Crimeans would opt to join Russia given the option, while 53.8% would preserve the region status as an autonomous republic of Ukraine. I believe this, this must have been a poll where people could choose uh, more than one option here, because okay, these, these numbers don't add up. But this is, this is what they published, right? So still a majority choosing, choosing Russia there, but certainly not the 90, 95, 98% that we saw in the referendum. All right, another, uh, in this case, comparing two different dates of, of uh, surveying here, between 2011 and 2013. Um, it was found that those who believed that Crimea should remain an autonomous republic within Ukraine drew from 49 to 53% over that period, while the number of those who believed it should be separated and given to Russia shrank from 33 to 23%. Right? So there's definitely some, some variation here in the results we see here. But you know, what it tells me is that we should really be, be looking at those referendum results with, with some, some skepticism, right? That's what you would think looking at those. But if we're going to look at some uh, data that's come out of Crimea since the annexation, right? Uh, there have been a couple polls to gauge the, the, or aimed at gaming public, gauging public opinion um, following the annexation, right? One conducted by geographers, uh, John O'Loughlin and Gerard, Gerard Toll, uh, in December 2014, found that 84% of Crimeans view the annexation as absolutely the right decision, right? With another, I believe, nine or so percent saying mostly the right decision, right? So. They pretty much all say this is what the right, was the right decision. Well, it's cut off a little bit here, but uh, another poll conducted just in January of this year found that 82% of Crimeans fully support Crimea's unification with Russia. Right, so these are independent uh, studies, not linked to to you know any sort of Russian authority. So you know I, I find it hard to question the, the the veracity of these of these numbers, right? But this is quite a stark contrast between public opinion leading in the years leading up to the to the events of 2014 and those in the years since, right? And so the question of what has happened, what has really inspired this, this shift in public opinion is uh, certainly a big one and one that I'm not fully prepared to answer here, but um, and one that definitely needs to be, to be um, studied and, and observed in a lot uh, more detail. Uh, but if I were to sort of venture a guess and to just sort of put my, my thoughts out there, it would have a lot to do with fears among Crimeans in, in response to the year of Maidan in response to the violence that's happened there, in response to the violence uh, seen, of course, in the Donbass, in eastern Ukraine, and fears of, uh, of some sort of similar scenario happening in Crimea, right? Though, 
With this, we need to keep in mind the role of the Russian media in both constructing and perpetuating these fears. Right? We see, for example, here a couple of images of uh, billboards uh, put up. Not directly the Russian media, I suppose, but these are these are uh, billboards that were established by Crimean authorities um, after a new government was put in place there. So operating ultimately under the direction of the Kremlin here. Um, that uh, really make it clear how they how they believe you should vote in the referendum here, right? It's making a clear distinction between the fascist regime now come to power in Kiev and the glorious Russian future that they'll have if they vote the right way, if they do the right thing, and say yes to joining Russia. Right? We see here how this sort of di this this narrative has has really taken grasp here. We see that the signs stop Ukrainian Nazism, right? This belief that that you. Ukraine has suddenly been seized by these far-right radicals, that they're out to get Russia, Russians, that, that uh, Russians in Crimea and elsewhere in Ukraine are now under threat from the, the Ukrainian regime. These are ideas that have certainly been, been uh, put forth uh, by uh, Russian officials and ones that have seemed to have, have uh, really taken hold among many of them. But that's not what my, my presentation is about here. Um, moving forward, I want to talk about some of the events, some of the discourse that has surrounded um, the celebration of the reunification of uh, Crimea with Russia here. We see uh, images here of uh, celebrations both from within Crimea and, and from within Russia, right? Some of these are com uh, come from the uh, celebration in Red Square on the anniversary just uh, last week, the anniversary of the, of the, the referendum. All right, we see signs, Russia, right? Crimea, this is Russia. Crimea is Rus Russian land, Ruska Zimlia, right? This, uh, this idea that came up a little bit earlier too, this new catchphrase, Krim Nash, uh, a common, common catchphrase bandied about now to sort of stick it to, to Ukraine, stick it to those who, who oppose the, the, the moves that Russia's taken to, to say that, well, you know, nana nana boo boo, we got, we got Crimea now, right? Um, I also want to highlight the use of the word Rodina here, uh, both in this billboard, uh, which went up in Sevastopol, right, saying what's next, right, you know, even if stones fall from the sky, who cares, we're, we're in our homeland now, right? This is also the name of the documentary about the, the events surrounding the annexation of Crimea that aired last week in Russia, Krim uh, Putz the path to the homeland, right? So there's this idea that Crimea has returned to its rightful homeland, that it's a place that has always been part of Russia, that who, whose separation from Russia has been an artificial creation, that this is sort of uh, correcting a historical wrong, and that this is an essentially and inherently Russian place, right? And uh, perhaps nobody has articulated these ideas better and more clearly than President Putin himself. So I have some quotes here. Um, I'll just read these off to you. Uh, one from his address immediately following his signing of the, uh, of the uh, treaty that officially um, uh, brought Crimea into the Russian Federation. It says, everything in Crimea speaks to our shared history and pride. This is the location of ancient Hersones, where Vladimir, uh, Prince Vladimir was baptized. The graves of Russian soldiers whose bravery brought Crimea into the Russian Empire are also in Crimea. This is also Sevastopol, a legendary city with an outstanding history, a fortress that, that serves as the, as the birthplace of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. Right? Crimea is Balaklava and Kerch, Malakhov Kurgan and Sapun Ridge, famous sites in both the Crimean and the, uh, and the, and the Crimean War and in World War II. Each one of these places is dear to our hearts, symbolizing Russian military glory and outstanding valor. And here's the key part. In people's hearts and minds, Crimea has always been an inseparable part of Russia. Right? It's the same idea that it's always been linked to Russia. It's never been anything else. Right? It's only right that it's now been returned. Right? This other uh, quote, just from December, an address to the Federal Assembly. It says, Crimea, the ancient Khersones, and Sevastopol have invaluable civilizational, even sacral importance for Russia, like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem for the followers of Islam and Judaism. So getting back to the idea of the sacred that uh, Edith brought up before, too. Right? So there's these myths and symbols that are being bandied about here with, with great regularity now to, to talk about how Crimea uh, is, is you know, deeply uh, and inherently Russian. Many of these, these narratives, these lines, have, are not, nothing new. Of course, these are all uh, part of what I call the Russian or Soviet national narrative of Crimea. And I'm painting in very broad strokes here uh, to, to paint a picture of this, but I want to highlight a couple of key elements in the way that um, Russian official narratives have, have portrayed Crimea, have linked it to to Russia's history, have put it right at the center uh, of many of the, the great um, you know, aspects and myths of Russian identity and history. Right? So of course, this, uh, the first two here are ones that, that Putin referenced directly in his speech. Right? So the, this uh, 
this former Greek colony of Hersones, located right outside of Sevastopol, um, was a place, um, according to legend, where Prince Vladimir of Kievan Rus was baptized. It was essentially the moment of birth for what ultimately would become Russian Orthodoxy. Right? So there's a very important civilizational religious link to the territory. Um, what he didn't mention quite so directly either was that there was also the time when Crimea was first brought into the Russian Empire, this view that, oh, this former Greek colony, this is sort of a link to uh, Greek civilization, to ancient Greece. So this is also, you know, has become part of the, the uh, cultural and civilizational DNA that, has, that uh, Russia has incorporated or did incorporate at the time into uh, itself by, by incorporating Crimea. And so there's very, significant, uh, very great significance there in Hersones in particular. All right, but Sevastopol, just down the way from Hersones, is another key element to these narratives of Crimea. Right, the defense of Sevastopol, both in the Crimean War and in World War II, uh, has become the stuff of legends. Right? It was blockaded, it was bombarded, it was destroyed on two in two separate wars, two separate occasions, and been rebuilt. And if you visit Sevastopol today, it's something of a living monument to Russian and Soviet military glory and, and valor. Um, and so it's become you know, a very, very um, special uh, place uh, in, in Russian and Soviet narratives of sort of strength and heroism and ultimately identity, right? And one uh, other element that Putin didn't mention, but I'm sure uh, many of us here would recognize as being an important aspect of Crimea, is uh, sort of a more populist uh, component of the narrative, that Crimea has been um, the premier destination uh, for tourists in the Soviet Union for a long time, right? This was a place that was, uh, you know, where, all, where, where people got to take their vacations, where there were a number of sanatoria, there were summer camps, these are places that, this is the place that, uh, people from across the Soviet Union long to go to and to spend their time, right? I was actually thinking about the, the presentation earlier, Tyler's on, on Comey and how sort of its role as a place of exile and a place where people didn't want to be sent has become uh, an important part of the regional identity there. Well, it's exactly the opposite for Crimea. It being a place where people wanted to go has become central to um, how Crimeans view their, their region, the pride that they have in, in being a place of, of, of uh, uh, envy, if you will, of, of others from throughout Russia and the former Soviet space. So we can see uh, Putin uh, and some of the Russian media, you know, getting directly at some of the, the components of this narrative. But it is by no means the only narrative about Crimea that we need to consider, right? While right, Russians do comprise the majority of the population there, uh, there are important minorities, Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, and a number of others who have their own narratives about Crimea and what it is and what it represents to them and how it informs their sense of identity there. Right, so for Crimean Tatars, right, this is, they make up about 12% of the population, according to the last census in 2001. Right, these are a Turkic-speaking Muslim group. Right? Uh, and the way they view Crimea is very different from how Russians view Crimea. For them, Crimea is, and nothing else, is viewed as homeland. Their, their concept of homeland is intimately tied to the territory of Crimea. This has emerged in large part due to the fact that they view their ethnogenesis, their emergence as a distinct ethnic group, uh, as coming from the diversity of different peoples who lived in Crimea itself, right? Crimea has been a place of settlement by myriad different groups, Scythians, Hazars, Tavris, Greeks, Armenians, Goths, many different groups who have come, come through over the, over the millennia, many of which have, have survived in small pockets throughout the, the peninsula. And it was under uh, the authority of the Crimean Khanate uh, from the you know, 1400s, 1700s, that the uh, Crimean Tatar ethnicity first coalesced from all these different groups, right? There are different distinct tribal, er tribal groups within the Crimean Tatar community that have formed from different parts of the, of, the, of the peninsula and based on sort of intermixing among specific groups that were found in those areas, right? So they all became united under a common language and under a common religion under the authority of the Crimean Hanuk. And so their very existence as an ethnic community is due in large part to the territory and the, 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 the geography of Crimea itself. And this is, is a very uh, salient and potent idea for them. Right? The, the, uh, the period of the Crimean Khanate is another important element of their, of their uh, narratives about the, about the region here. Right? The Crimean Khanate was a, uh, a you know, strong political force in Eastern Europe for three centuries. Right? It existed, um, uh, in fact, for a period longer than, than the Russians have even been in Crimea, as it were, right? They, they arrived in the late 1700s, and it's been less than, less than 300 years since the moment they first annexed Russia, whereas the Crimean, or, excuse me, annexed uh, Crimea, uh, whereas the Crimean Tatars were there for a period of about 300 years under the, the leadership of the Crimean Khanate. Uh, 
right? And um, as I'm sure many of you know, the Crimean Tatars were among the deported peoples uh, of uh, the Soviet era, right? In fact, I believe they're one of the, the largest numbered deported peoples of all, right? They were sent away from Crimea in 1944 on the allegation that they had collaborated with the German occupiers during World War II. And so on May 18, 1944, they were rounded up en masse, loaded onto cattle cars, and shipped to Central Asia and to Siberia. It's estimated that around 42% of the population died en route, which is from starvation, from the conditions on the train. Right? So this is a seriously traumatic event for the Crimean Tatars, not just because they suffered so many losses in terms of the, the, the deaths that happened, but it took them from their homeland. Right? And this has been a very, very important element of their narratives of national identity. Right? Whereas the Soviet authorities hoped and assumed that they would simply integrate into their surrounding populations among the Turkic, and, uh, Turkic speakers and Muslims that they were uh, resettled amongst, mainly in Uzbekistan, right? Um, but this didn't happen, right? The attachment to Crimea and the yearning to return to Crimea served as a bulwark against uh, assimilation for the Crimean Tatars. And they maintained uh, one of the most remarkable campaigns of protest against the Soviet authorities throughout the late Soviet period, right? They, they, they did not relent. They, they staged uh, protests on Red Square. Uh, one of the, uh, nowadays, one of the prominent Crimean Tatar leaders, uh, Mustafa Jamilov, um, uh, stage one of, I believe it's the longest hunger strike in history that we're familiar with for almost a year. I don't know, I'm not sure how he must have been force fed, but, but he, he went on a hunger strike for over a year for the right for Crimean Tatars to return to Crimea. That's how important their homeland was to them. Right? And it wasn't until the late 1980s, just before the collapse of the Soviet Union, that were finally given the right to return. And not all of them have been able to, but about half of the population of the Crimean Tatars have since returned. And despite uh, Considerable hardship upon returning, right? They, they, they've endured, right? They found that their land and their former homes were occupied by Russians and Ukrainians and other groups who were there. So they sort of pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and, and started occupying uh, old uh, collective farm land, right? Built these shacks that they could call, them, call their home until they could build something better. And bit by bit sort of re rehabilitated their presence in, in Crimea and their right to the land. So for them, Crimea is, it's, it's, it, you can't really overstate how important Crimea is to them and how important it is to their sense of national identity. Of course, there is also the Ukrainian narrative of Crimea. Uh, and admittedly, right, we have to say that Ukraine has had far less time to develop narratives about Crimea, right? It has only been under any sort of Ukrainian authority since 1954, the date of the transfer of Crimea from the Russian uh, SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR, right? Uh, and it wasn't until you know, Ukrainian independence, that uh, there was any real effort to sort of, you know, build, have, have a nation and state building effort that incorporated Crimea into its, into its narratives, right? So uh, this included a drawn out period of negotiation over the terms of Crimea's autonomy within a new independent Ukraine. Right? There was actually a referendum held uh, in January of 1991, just months before the collapse of the Soviet Union, to reinstate Crimea's autonomous status. It had lost its autonomy. Uh, with when the Crimean Tatars left, right? It was a national autonomy that had been based on the presence of this minority group. And without them there, they, it simply became the Crimean Oblast, which it remained as it, when it was transferred to Ukraine. Uh, but that autonomy was reinstated uh, by referendum, the, only, the first and only referendum uh, on autonomy within the Soviet Union. Right? So the terms of that, what that autonomy meant, what, how they were going to divide power between Kiev and Simferopol uh, was a sticky issue. It, uh, it arose at a time when there was, there was a, a strong uh, Russian separatist movement, right? Russian nationalism was strong in the early 90s. There was a, the specter of violence hanging over their heads. There were fears that Crimea was going to devolve into the type of violence seen in, in Abkhazia and in Transnistria, in right, and, and other, other parts of the region. Uh, but it was this long process of negotiation and, um, and compromise between Kiev and Simferopol that ultimately kept Crimea within Ukraine under uh, the conditions of autonomy, and uh, became an important part of, of the narratives of the new narratives of, of uh, Ukrainian state building. Right? So, Crimea has been imp an important place uh, in, for that reason in these narratives of state building, because it is the only part of, of uh, Ukraine that has a an ethnic Russian majority. Right? It only accounts for about 18 percent of all Russians who are living in in Ukraine. Right? There are far more Russians living in other parts of Ukraine than just in Crimea, but it was the only region that had a majority of, of uh, Russians within it. So precisely because it was so different, because it was sort of the greatest challenge uh, to central authority within Kiev, it became an important uh, project to try to 
bring it into the fold and to try to accommodate it and to try to bring it into you know, a cohesive Ukraine. And so it's played an important role in this idea of Ukraine being a state of regions, right? This is one of the elements of a Ukrainian national identity that has been pervasive. There have been more nationalistic strains as well, but um, some of these elements have been viewing Ukraine not as necessarily just a place for ethnic Ukrainians, right? But as a place that's sort of cobbled from a variety of different regions, right? Where you've got a lot of Russians, you've got Crimean Tatars, you've got Hungarians and Bulgarians in the West, you've got a lot of different groups. And so Ukraine should be celebrated as a state of regions, or this idea of subordinates, right? This coming together of these different elements to form something larger than some of its parts. Right? So Ukraine doesn't have these same sort of deep historical and mythical narratives to rely on, but there is still, you know, it still plays an important part in the narratives of what Ukraine is today, or what it was until last year at least. All right? But I also want to highlight some other important narratives that have been pervasive about Crimea. Right? And that it has also been portrayed as a place that is wholly beautiful, wholly unique and exotic, and a place that is very different from those others around it. Different from Russia, different from Ukraine, even though it plays such an important role for both of them. Right? There are early Orientalist tropes that were used to describe Crimea at the time of its impending annexation by the Russian Empire in the, in the uh, late 1700s. Right? This is a time at the height of European colonialism when uh, Orientalist tropes were quite common throughout many different European um, colonial powers, right, and sort of possessing a piece of the Orient, if you will, was sort of seen as a, as a, a way to legitimize your, your, uh, your, yourself as, a, as an imperial power. And so uh, Russia, the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great sort of eyed Crimea as this, this exotic little, little plum hanging from, from near its territory into the Black Sea, is something that it very it strongly desired to possess, if you will. And again, I'm painting in very broad strokes here. Uh, but those, uh, those Orientalist ideas have been with Crimea since the very beginning of its inclusion within Russia, right? It also portrayed Crimea as sort of a miniature Garden of Eden, right? Its ethnic diversity and its, uh, and its sort of biological diversity of plants and the flora and fauna were seen as being important elements of this, sort of this, this place being wholly different, being a garden, being a magnificent place that Russia really wanted to, to have control over, right? And as Russia was incorporated into, or as Crimea was incorporated into the Russian Empire, it became a destination for many uh, traveling poets and artists and, and people from Russia who fell in love with the region. We see Pushkin lounging by the, by the ocean here in Crimea in this painting, right? And so there uh, developed a distinct sort of uh, literary and aesthetic tradition about writing and portraying Crimea that uh, has, has really, you know, be taken root within, within Russian literary and artistic traditions. Right? It's also been celebrated as a place of tolerance and diversity. Right, because of its, of its uh, you know, ethnic diversity, it's sort of um, seen as being a place for, as being special for that reason. Sort of an anecdotal account of this is that while, uh, while the Peace Corps still had their operations in Crimea before the events of last year, um, they would often send their Peace Corps volunteers who were from minority groups from the United States, they would often send them to Crimea because they were, it was seen as being a place that was more accepting of, uh, of minority groups and of those uh, types of people that they might not encounter otherwise. Right? So it's anecdotal, but it, I think it speaks to a, to a, a bigger idea here. Getting back to those nas Russian national narratives, they've certainly uh, experienced a resurgence. They've certainly become hegemonic in the way Crimea is discussed within the past year. Right? But they've done a lot to uh, sort of mask and obfuscate uh, these competing national narratives. Right? Uh, that's sort of been used to reify this view that identity among uh, Crimeans falls into some sort of pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian binary. Or rather, there are pro-Russians and a few people who aren't pro-Russian, right? Who would otherwise be pro-Ukrainian, ultimately pro-Western is how, how the, the, the argument would go, right? So I argue that this uh, is problematic, for one, because it, it silences important uh, uh, alternate, alternative voices in Crimea, but it also masks the strength and pervasiveness of Crimean regional identities, right, that are tied to the region and, and that are understood through different lenses offered by these national narratives, right? So I conducted a survey in Crimea in the summer of 2011, so over two years before the outbreak of the Euromaidan, so well before um, any of this was, was sort of thrown into question here. Uh, this was a survey that consisted of 798 uh, respondents um, taken throughout Crimea, and um, I want to share some, some of the results from that survey with you that sort of get at this idea that uh, a sense of Crimean regional identity, an attachment to the region, is a much more salient component of identity there than affinities for 
either Ukraine or Russia, as has been betrayed to us through, through much of the discourse in the past year. All right, so the first component I want to share here was a question I asked respondents. I asked them, how important are the following factors, of, uh, following factors to your self-identity? So, so I gave a few sort of spatial factors, right, living in various scales, so some scalar components here, living in your town, living in Crimea, living in Ukraine, living in Europe, and your Soviet past, sort of, I mean, sort of a spatial but also cultural component here, but also components of sort of national identity, so your nationality, your na native language, and your religious beliefs, right? So I've, I've uh, shown the average responses for all three groups here, Russians, Ukrainians, and Crimean Tatars, and uh, what I'd like to draw your attention to is, first of all, uh, the strength of responses for the question of how important living in Crimea is to your national identity. All right, for each of these groups, it is highest among these spatial components, right? Stronger than living in your town, although it is fairly high there too, but certainly higher than living in Ukraine, living in Europe, or an attachment to a Soviet past. Right? Uh, among Ukrainians, it's a little bit, you know, they're a little closer to each other, right? Um, and they're also the group that identifies most with, with living in Ukraine, right? I'd also point out that uh, these elements of sort of national identity are also quite high. And right? we see, I, I did run some statistical analyses to see where there were uh, statistically significant differences here. I didn't figure it would be worth sharing those here. I just to get, at the, get at the meat of the question here just by showing the graph. But uh, um, we can see that elements of nationality and the uh, idea of living in Crimea form sort of the, the strongest pillars of, of identity among the questions or the factors I included here. All right, and this, this is, can you see this all right? I was worried if it was going to be too washed out. Yeah, I think you can see it. Uh, so one of the other questions I, I had, one of the other things I had my respondents do was to draw a map of their homeland, Rodina, right? I'm getting back to this, this, this term that I, that I wanted to, to, to point out earlier. Uh, so to draw a map of their homeland and to label the, the three most important places within it. Right? So I got a variety of maps of people indicating where they, they viewed their homeland being. Right, and so some of these, you can see, definitely fall into line with what some of the, the narratives and the dialogues have been saying today, right? That Crimea, especially this one, right? They didn't even draw a map, they just wrote three things, Moskva, Peter, Krim, Rasiski, right? <laughs> Moscow, St. Peter, in, oh, is it missing? Oh, yeah, well, there you go. Um, but we see many others here, either, either showing Russia or the Soviet Union, right? And in most cases here, we can see Crimea uh, really occupying a very... Um, important place there being very heavily emphasized, right? So there certainly are uh, those who, who do view this idea of homeland in terms that are being, that are being discussed now in, uh, in response to Crimea's uh, rejoining Russia. But there are also those who drew Ukraine, right? People who um, saw their homeland as extending beyond Crimea into the, the, the nation state of Ukraine. So it speaks to the power of, uh, of Ukrainian nation building and state building over the past 20 or so years. Right? But again, notice how Crimea is, is overemphasized in many of these maps. Right? And just to show, I got a wide variety of responses, ranging from the very small scale, from someone's garden, to the very large scale, the entire world, right? and everything in between. Right? Some neighborhoods, a house, city of Sevastopol, right? Eastern Europe in this case. Uh, but the most important finding was the prevalence with which I saw maps only of Crimea. Right? Here's just a sampling. Right? I don't know how some of these are, are pretty faded. I wish I could see them better. But uh, this is just a selection, right? We see, for one, a, a pretty, pretty good familiarity with the shape of Crimea, for one. And in, in the work I've done, I've gone into the prevalence of the Crimea logo map, as I call it, sort of the image of Crimea being used and reproduced everywhere and sort of informing senses of regional identity in that sense. Uh, but you can see here, this one includes the Crimean Tatar national symbol on top of it, sort of branding it with sort of the, the sense of national identity as well, right? So to break these down by scale, right, we can see one very clear trend, right? Among, for, for those who drew their homeland map only at the scale of Crimea, for each group, it's, it's pretty overwhelming, right? So about half of all Russians included in this survey drew only Crimea, right? There's a little bit split more for Ukrainians between Crimea and the rest of Ukraine, but still a majority, or well, I guess a plurality here, uh, drew Crimea, 40, about 40.1 percent, with about 35.5 percent drawing Ukraine. Uh, but especially among Crimean Tatars, you can see over 78 uh, percent drew their homeland as being only Crimea. And this gets back to the idea I talked about, of their, their concept of, of homeland being deeply tied to, to Crimea. All right, and getting at the heart of the matter, 
um, regard, in, especially in regard to the, the referendum of last year. One of the questions I also asked was, what should Crimea's political status be? Right, so this was fairly prescient, right? I had, I had no idea what was to come when I was at a couple of years down the road when I asked this question. Uh, but I put this question to my uh, survey participants, but gave them more options, not just a, a preference for Russia for Ukraine, but also adding an element of uh, whether or not they preferred autonomy or not. So they had uh, six choices here. They could say remain an autonomous republic of, of Ukraine, basically maintain the status quo, or they could choose to remain in Ukraine but without their autonomous status, to become a non-autonomous administrative territory, oblast, right? They also had the same two options but within Russia. So to join Russia as an autonomous republic or to join it as an oblast. They also had the choice to, uh, to take independence, for Crimea to become independent, and the optional other category. And so I've broken them down uh, between groups here. I included the other, right, those who were neither Russian nor Ukrainian nor Crimean Tatar in this case. I got, I got a handful of those, some other smaller groups there. Um, I just want to point out a few things here. Of course, among Russians, we do see a majority saying that they would join Russia either as an autonomous republic or an oblast, right? The, the red and the purple there together would, would correspond to a, a preference for Russia. But note that about a quarter also said they would remain in, in Ukraine, either as an autonomous republic or as an oblast. We can see with the other groups that the choice to join Russia is definitely in the majority, and the choice to remain within uh, Ukraine is in the majority. Right? Um, and I couldn't help sort of teasing this out a little bit after the referendum last year and to see, to try to speculate what a refer if a referendum had been held at the time of my survey, right? So a couple years before, uh, the events of 2014, if a similar uh, referendum were to be held, what uh, kind of votes we might have seen. Right? The uh, there was a problem in that uh, my sample was not uh, wholly representative of the Crimean population. Right? I undersampled Russians while um, oversampling the other groups here. Right? So in order to provide a sort of an aggregated view of, of how they might have voted, I had to weigh them accordingly. So these, this, this graph accounts for this, this um, uh, discrepancy in the, in, the, in the sample here. Uh, but I, I don't want to linger too long on this, on this graph because I sort of broke it down into a couple components that really highlight some main points here on the next slide. So I broke this down on the left, uh, showing the preference for, uh, for which country, either for Russia or Ukraine. Right? So here we have the choice for remain an autonomous republic or become an oblast of Ukraine, and here for joining Russia either as an autonomous republic or an oblast, and then uh, independence and other lumped in together. Right? So we see with those weighted totals that a preference for Ukraine does come out ahead, or excuse me, for Russia does come out ahead, right? If we ignore sort of the, the outliers here a little bit for now, 45.5% uh, said they would choose Russia, while about 39% said they would choose Ukraine. And I've, I've gone into this and tried to look at the, that remaining 15.4% and tried to guess which way these people might have voted, breaking it down according to different, uh, different criteria. I'm not going to go into all that detail here, just, um, but if I, I, I can say that I think based on, on my analysis in that sense, uh, the, the choice to join uh, Russia would have come out ahead. So I, I think there would have been, ultimately, uh, a vote to join Russia had a, a referendum been held that was sanctioned by the Constitution, that was, that was done in an orderly fashion, that, that met all the standards of, a, of what a referendum should be. If it had been held at the time of my survey, we probably would have seen uh, the choice to join Russia. But I want to highlight this other graph that breaks it down, not according to the preference for country, but according to the preference for uh, what type of political status, either for autonomy or for non-autonomy, regardless of which country they, they prefer to be in. All right, so here in the purple, with uh, nearly 69%, is the preference for autonomy. Whereas here we have, which is about 16%, the preference for no autonomy, right, for oblast status, with another, again, that 12.8% for independence, and 2.6% uh, other, right? So what this says to me, is that rather than there being uh, a really salient idea of being either pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian, as this map suggests, it's, it's much more evenly split than we might think otherwise, where we see the real key to uh, sort of political preference here is the choice for autonomy, right? This idea that Crimea should, no matter what state it's in, it should have an autonomous status. It should be held up to a different standard. It should have this unique status. All right, and I, uh, I pulled out a couple of quotes here from Gwendolyn Sasse, one of the leading uh, authorities on um, sort of identity and politics in Crimea. And she has this to say about autonomy in Crimea. She says, the territorial autonomy status acknowledges the political significance or distinct nature of a particular region. 
Often the ethnic composition of a territorial unit leads to demands for a special administrative or political status and cultural rights. Thus, autonomy can reinforce the link between ethnicity and territory. Multi-ethnicity can also become a stimulus for a special regions, uh, regions, regional status. And Crimea exemplifies both of these trends. Right? It's this idea that Crimea is viewed as being special. Right? People from Crimea view it as a special place, both from a sort of a national perspective, right? according to whichever national perspective they may be viewing it from. Right? For, for all the reasons I've outlined, Crimea is a very special place for Russians. It's a special place for Crimean Tatars. It's a special place for Ukrainians, but for different reasons. Right? Uh, there's also this, this quote from more recently from Sasse from last year that Crimea's power, powers are politically weak and underdefined. Overall, Crimean autonomy functions primarily at a symbolic level. Right? So it doesn't really have any substance to it. It doesn't really give uh, Crimeans all that, that high of a degree of local, local authority. Right? It is mainly there to sort of symbolize the special status of this place and to sort of politically institutionalize its, its, its role as being this, this very special and unique place to the people who live there in, in, in many senses. All right, so I want to bring it around to my few conclusions here. Right. The regionalism, at least prior to 2014, uh, has formed a more salient basis of socio-spatial identities in Crimea than affinities for either Russia or Ukraine. That Crimeans largely understand the concept of homeland as tied to Crimea itself, but divergent national narratives and mythologies provide different lenses that filter their views of the region and inform their sense of attachment to Crimea. I also say that the events of 2014, including the Euromaidan, the annexation of Crimea, and the continuing conflict in the Donbass, and the Russian's, Russian media's betray, presentation of betrayal of all these, these uh, events, have almost certainly sharpened pro-Russian and anti-Ukrainian sentiments among Crimeans. But this does not mean that Crimean identities fit neatly into this pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian binary that we've sort of been presented with in the past year. All right, and I'll finish there.